What is at stake and far more important is an individual's humanity, values and spiritual life and the ethics by which one conducts one's life. Recent works on the global refugee crisis and the attendant issues of migration, danger, loss of life and familial separation point to Zarina's sensitive understanding of the precariousness of life and of her own mortality. She says, when I lay in bed at night, I think about the 10-year-old Rohingya children fleeing Myanmar and the 10-year-old Syrian children climbing into boats. I can't join the resistance, but I protest through my work, memorializing destroyed cities and communities. I'd like to end the lecture with two works from the artist's latest series of works titled No Escape from 2015, which further elucidate Zarina's fears and concerns about global geopolitics, warfare, and technologies of surveillance. Using recycled woodblock prints, woodblock prints drenched in black Sumi ink, Zarina's intricate and suffocating webs are places of no escape and trenchant reminders of the world's escalating weaponization, both physical and digital. Thank you. Now we have lots of time, so just raise your hands and I'll just point and then yeah, sure. so we can see. That comprehensive. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to try to show you things that are not normally seen. No, the first works are always the, the, the relief prints. Um, sorry. <clears throat> the garden is, is later. That's Rani's garden. But the, if you remember the first um, woodblocks from 68, 69 are actually sculptural because she's using wood that she finds right outside the studio in Delhi. And she's using them to make direct prints on the paper. Um, so they're not carved. They're, they're using found sculptures or found pieces of wood and you're making direct prints. So there's a sculptural quality already, but she's working in two dimensions. She's working with paper. It might make sense to just escape it and go back to the early work. Can we just close yeah. it and go back? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess the first sculptural works are really the cast paper sculptures. Has her work been shown in India or Pakistan? Uh, she shows with Renu Modi, uh, which is a gallery espace in Delhi. So she's had quite a few exhibitions there. Um, Pakistan's a sore topic. Um, she says that she feels exiled from everywhere um, because she needs a visa to come into India because she has a US passport. Um, she made a comment once where she was too Muslim to come to India, too Muslim to be in the United States, and yet too Indian to be in Pakistan. <laughs> and, um, and she said it's a very difficult situation to, to be in, um, and it's something that she speaks about quite emotionally when you talk to her about it. Um, any other questions? Thank you for this. Uh, oh, I was, thank you. I was just wondering, uh, you know, when you, you mentioned that there was a grid that behind she, the pin drawings. Yeah, when she's talking of modernity, and it struck me that those seem to also play a lot with repetition. Yes. And I was wondering if uh, she says something about the idea of repetition, uh, not just in terms of a meditative practice, but maybe, I mean, is there any relation she sees? Uh, with modernities 
You know, when she was working on the pin drawings, remember I mentioned that her husband died in 77. And those first years when she was making the pin drawings were actually some of the most difficult years of her life. It's extraordinary that one of the most beautiful series, which are the pin drawings, were created at a time of incredible loss and self-doubt. Uh, so for her, it wasn't, she, and this is the thing that happens to a lot of artists in retrospect. We ascribe art historical models to them. We say they're abstract, we say that they're minimal, we say that they're process art, they're anti-form, they're all of this. But she was never somebody who followed art history. Um, her relationships really came through individual artists and the exhibitions she saw, the books that she read, the places that she traveled, the, pe the friendships that she had. Um, so for her, repetition wasn't about the canon of minimalism or the canon of abstraction. It was just her way of dealing with her own sorrow. Uh, it's a private, intimate practice of sitting at home and doing this kind of repetitive action to probably blot out some of the emotions that she's feeling. Um, all of these things have happened to her subsequently. We've tried to pigeonhole her into all of these different categories. She says, you've called me a feminist, you've called me Muslim, you've called me South Asian, you've called me a woman, you've called me a minimalist, you've called me an abstractionist, but I'm none of these. That's very important. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Also, coming back to the idea of dividing line and her take on that, she's also produced a line drawing, sorry, a pin drawing, the line that I cannot erase. No, I don't. 20, I, 13 or 24. Thank you for letting me know. I don't know about this one. It came to gallery as past for Edwin's year exhibition. And it's called the line? The line I cannot erase. So, Lana's take on the dividing line. On the dividing line. line. But done as a pin drawing. Thank you. I mean, the line, right? It comes through calligraphy. It comes through the woodblock print. It comes through how you gouge something. It comes in abstraction. It comes in geometry. It comes in architecture. It comes in mathematics. Um, it comes through the found wood. Um, you could do a whole study of just her understanding of the line. So the dividing line, the border, map making. There's a whole series that she did of the river in Delhi how she creates maps, how she creates kind of these aerial views of the different places that have meant something to her. But with Zarina, it's always from her own lived experience. This isn't, this isn't something that she's just reading about in the newspaper, or even though she's an avid follower of politics, um, I remember all the times I visited her in New York, she had an opinion about something or the other. She was constantly watching television. She had four Macintoshes uh, constantly Googling, you know, contemporary politics, somebody who was very interested in what was happening around her, but had her own voice and her own individual, nuanced, intimate way of processing all of it through her own hand and her own eye and her own body and what she was able to do through her own table in that studio. Thank you. Um, if any of her work has some sort of, I mean, if she's indulged in any work with a patron or with a client or, sorry, or this is, um, I, yeah, commissioned work or is this all just a series works. and uh, no. no, no, that's not the method. Okay, um, so. it's never been by invitation. Yeah, this is just work that has been produced on a very kind of consistent basis from her studio. Of, we saw some of the work that be, had been done in Delhi. Um, and then since 1976, she's really just been working and living in that studio in Manhattan. Um, but it's never been a commission in response to an invitation. It's always been s ideas and subjects and concerns and questions and propositions that were inherently and deeply and ideologically rooted to her own practice. So, I mean, she started with like just paper. And yes. Just, like analyzing it yeah, from sure. her. And then she moves into, in the end, to, you know, um, 22 karat gold and stuff like that. So I was just wondering that kind of a process. But the gold, is, the gold leaf is still used on paper. So yeah, for her, the gold, that, but, the gold uh, is just a kind of abstracted way of thinking about the divine, of thinking about Noor, of thinking about her own mortality and how her own soul is going to merge 
with that blinding light. So yeah. she talks about spirituality, not just in Islam and with Sufism, but also in Western traditions and Catholicism and Hinduism. Um, she's very, very well read. And um, for her, the, the use of the gold leaf is just an invitation to us to think about the spiritual realm. Uh, but again, through this abstracted form, you know, through this incredibly pared down form. Uh, but paper has really been her, her mainstay, right from the first woodblock from 1961, right till, you know, even work that she's producing now. I, I remember you were saying something in the middle where she said that, um, you know, I'm, I, I don't have money and uh, pin drawings. Is, I think that was the stage yeah. where... Yeah. In the so 70s. I was wondering how that kind of translate. I mean, you know, to experiment with like sculptural objects, like or you don't have a. But the sculptural how? works are again done in very. I mean, the the crawling houses are made out of tin. I mean, it's always you know materials that were quite, quite you know inexpensive. And inexpensive. Yes. Okay. You know, and again, your, the wood block is done in a series. It's yeah. always a series of ten or fifteen or twenty-five. Um, there was always a limited means in terms of materiality. It's only when she was able to get gallery representation through Espas and also through Loring Augustine that she was able to start to work with gold leaf and obsidian that was the only, uh, and materials source, like basically. that. Absolutely. But again, nothing ever ostentatious because yeah. along with working with gold leaf and obsidian, she was also still using her old wood blocks, you know, discarded prints. If you saw, remember her studio, she had these flats, she has these beautiful archival boxes, everything is archived. Um, you know, the, there are woodblock prints from the 70s, 80s, 90s that she never threw away, but through the collaging and the assembling and the cutting and the interweaving, she, she uses them again. And it's a way of looking back at those old images and narratives and reformulating them, asking new questions, creating new images. Thank you. Hello. I really enjoyed that. Um, Thank you. But I actually have a question to you about the curatorial process. Okay. Um, I, I don't know much about it. So how do, do you usually take your, uh, like an artist or an idea or a theme to the museum? Or do you get um, maybe commissioned by a museum to bring artists in? How does it work? Okay. Um, gosh, that's a right. I know. <laughs> For most people here, it must be like a stupid question. No, it's not. A, nothing <laughs> is ever a stupid question. I don't even believe in that premise, first of all. Um, because curatorial studies are still very nascent in India. So you have a right to ask me this question. Um, so I'll just tell you with the case of, uh, I'll just give you a bit of history. So Anish Kapoor was the first artist I worked with at the Guggenheim. And that was a major commission. Um, and that was being spons sponsored by Deutsche Bank. So Deutsche Bank and the Guggenheim had a 15-year relationship. And um, every few years, we had the money from the bank to create a new work of art that would either go to Deutsche Bank or come to the Guggenheim's permanent collection. Um, and in that scenario, you, you, you choose the artist that, whose work you really want in the collection. You go to them. You invite them. They create several propositions. You choose one of them. And then you actually spend the next three years making them. You make the work, you exhibit it, you write about it, you contextualize it. Uh, in the case with Zarina, um, I was very privileged to meet her the year I moved to New York in 2001 because of my mother. Zarina had been on an academic panel um, for South Asian scholars. Um, and it was the first time that contemporary artists had been invited to this because it was usually people who are working with the pre-modern. And um, you know, the, the, the 10 years that I lived in New York, were changed because of my relationship with Zarina Hashmi. And um, at the time that I met her, she had a very close coterie of artists and filmmakers and critics who really venerated her and loved her, people like Krishna Reddy and Ram Rahman and Naveena Haider, who continued to be her friends. But she wasn't really known in the art world in general. And it was a pity, because you have so many great artists who are living in your own city who go completely under-recognized. As soon as I joined the Guggenheim in 2007, I was really keen to try to rectify that. And the first thing we did was acquire 20 of the pin drawings that I had seen with her. And I really felt that they needed to be in a major museum collection. And I promised her that at one point I would try to help her. And I made a curatorial proposition to the museum, was able to convince them, and then we acquired the works for the collection. And so when it came time to 
to do the retrospective, we knew that we had the pin drawings as a beautiful stage to finally uh, unveil them to the public. Um, but she was very lucky that she had three curators, one at the Hammer, one at the Guggenheim, and one at the Chicago, who had followed her practice for a very long time and were all keen to work with her. And therefore, you had three institutions that shared the retrospective as a touring retrospective. So again, it's an artist that you really believe in. It's not, you, you believe in them for five years, 10 years, 15 years sometimes. You find the right occasion to collaborate with them because you really respect them and honor them and, and learn something from them. Um, so we were able to acquire the work first and then you know, four years later do the retrospective. So every um, situation is different.